Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this webinar. What we're going to talk about today is social media and crisis management, specifically using a use case around uh, what's been happening uh, in the last month with the NFL around uh, domestic violence. And so we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through what the situation was and show you how a NetVibe dashboard as well as Prostina uh, social media management tool could be used um, in terms of best practices in order to identify a, a crisis such as the NFL while it's, ha while it's happening and uh, respond in real time. So um, with that, uh, let me introduce you uh, to the people that will be on the webinar. I'm Kim Tersa. I'm with NetVibe. And uh, my co-presenter is uh, Marty Levine with Persona. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Marty, who's going to uh, walk us through the NFL crisis. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes uh, before we get into the meat of uh, what happened to the NFL, just uh, talk a bit about how corporate crises emerging and how they uh, go from uh, a brush fire to a, a full-blown uh, conflagration. Um, it's important to remember that the trigger point for uh, for a crisis often uh, comes from events that are beyond the control of the company. Um, you know, uh, an example uh, that comes to mind is uh, what happened with Norwegian Airlines earlier this year. Uh, the airlines had absolutely no way to anticipate that two planes would go down and for very different reasons and what that would do uh, to the company's brand and the strain that it would put on uh, the entire organization. Uh, you know, bluntly, sometimes a company is just in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, and is settled with uh, you know, what comes down to guilt by association, hidden agendas of some of the protesters, uh, a number of factors that are all external, or even uh, the proverbial sacrificial lamb. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this from uh, personal experience. You've got an ally, a partner, a business partner of some type who, um, you know, something goes wrong and they, they decide to throw your company under the bus. Um, but regardless of how it starts, there are always signs that you uh, will be able to spot, things that start to happen before it gets under out of control. Uh, it's just a matter of knowing where to look. But then let's turn to what happens when things do start to get hot uh, and how a crisis goes from, you know, emerging to exploding. And uh, more often than not, this is due to internal blunders. Uh, this is where companies, uh, after the crisis is over, they look back and they go, woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, uh, the things that we should have said, the things we should have done, uh, the opportunities that we had to really cut things off before they got out of control. Uh, and a lot of this is you know, just because uh, in some organizations they haven't planned for this, they haven't prepared effectively. And because they haven't prepared, uh, they take the wrong steps at the wrong time. Uh, you don't know uh, who's in charge, you don't know uh, what to say, uh, and you don't know what to do. Um, by the way, um, you know, the last bullet point on this slide, spectacularly bad customer service. Um, it always pays to remember who your core base is, who your, your customers are, and how they're going to react. Um, you know, uh, just one quick example. Uh, some of you may have seen this. Um, there was a, uh, a band a couple of years back that uh, had their guitars uh, along with the luggage on United Airlines. Uh, United did not uh, handle things particularly well when the, uh, the guitars were damaged. And if you Google United Breaks Guitars, uh, you'll see a great example of what not to do. So let's turn this now to the specifics of what happened with the NFL. Uh, and uh, I'll start by saying that the blind side hit here arguably goes back uh, more than a few years. Uh, none of what has happened over the last month or so is new. Uh, players have misbehaved before. Uh, there have been incidents that involve police. Uh, you know, players act badly just as some employees act badly. Um, you know, with that in mind, the triggering events here were certainly beyond the control of the league. And, you know, they had no way to anticipate that Ray Rice would do what he did. Um, 
and uh, they certainly had no way to know that there would be one incident after another that really just built up into a perfect storm. Um, I'm a former journalist, so I just want to say a few words on how the media fits into this. Um, and uh, many of you are probably aware of this, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, I don't care what news outlet you want to consider, uh, whether you're a B2C company dealing with the consumer press, whether you're a B2B company dealing with trade or business press, there are reporters and editors out there and their managers all desperate for a good story. Uh, and nothing makes for a better story than scandal. Uh, and there's no better scandal than an icon being taken down. So all of that fed into what happened to the NFL. Uh, having said all of that, uh, I think we all know the NFL fumbled its response. Uh, it, it said the wrong things. It did the wrong things. It didn't react on a timely uh, uh, basis. Uh, and let's get into some of the specifics. If you have a press conference, you better have something to say. Uh, and you better have something to say of substance that addresses the issue. Uh, when Commissioner Goodell uh, got up there and he said, we're going to do better, and he didn't say how they were going to do better, uh, all that happened from that is, is people piled on. Um, you know, the, the initial problem was uh, the Ray Rice incident. Uh, by not taking forceful action to address the problem, uh, he only fanned the flames again. Uh, and then you start getting into some of the uh, other uh, more egregious missteps, uh, indications that the league knew more than it said it knew, uh, rogue employee possibly having the tape, and, of course, never really apologizing to the fans. Uh, you look at all that, it's a perfect storm of uh, you know, uh, bad statements, uh, being slow to respond, failure to act decisively, uh, the hint of some internal scandal, and apparently some rogue employees. Uh, and, of course, again, failing to apologize to the fans. So the result was predictable uh, if you look back at it. Uh, you know, just horrible press coverage uh, and horrible press coverage across the board and consistently, uh, and it just built up and up. Uh, social media just fanning the flames there as fans got into this, and, and the end result, uh, profoundly tarnished brand for the NFL, uh, something that might take years for the league to uh, recover from. So, you know, that's what went wrong. Uh, we'd like to talk to you a little bit more about what could have gone right and what you could do. So I'll turn this back over to Kim. Kim? Yep. Thanks, Marty. Uh, let's see. So let me uh, take that control of the screen and pull up the slides. Great. Uh, so I just wanted to let everyone know uh, we're going to do a Q&A at the end of the call. So if you have any questions that come up, uh, please go ahead and type them into uh, the box that should be on your screen, uh, and then we'll address all questions at the end. So as far as uh, best practices for social crises, uh, these apply not only to the NFL, but any crisis that you might be facing uh, with your organization online. Uh, one of the key of uh, one of the key secrets is to continually monitor uh, so that you don't get blindsided. Now, uh, one way to do this, of course, is uh, I'm sure everyone has uh, you know, their, their social media set up, but what can be really helpful is to have a dashboard with all the different social channels uh, in one place so that we are continually monitoring, and that way you can uh, respond quickly uh, once a crisis actually arises. Um, so you can uh, act proactively and help shape the conversation uh, before it gets out of control and becomes a, a huge uh, crisis. So another thing that's important is to be honest and transparent. Of course, you want to follow your legal counsel's advice, but um, even uh, just responding quickly, even if all you can say is, you know, we, we know this is happening, we don't have all the facts yet, but we're looking into it and we'll get back to you, can go a long way to reassuring people that you're listening to them, that you care about uh, the public's opinion and that you will uh, be forthcoming with the, the details uh, as soon as you can. Um, another uh, important thing is that once you 
Uh, so once you know that the crisis is happening and you're responding, uh, that gives you a chance to uh, subtly shift the conversation. So of course, it's, it's not going to do any good to try and sweep everything under the rug. But what you can do is you can acknowledge the problem and uh, you know, take responsibility for your actions, but then at the same time, uh, shift the conversation. So for example, uh, the NFL does you know, a lot of things that uh, do support women. And so uh, they could be talking about some things like that in order to just subtly shift the conversation. Be like, we know this is a problem, but we, we care, we're doing these things. Um, another way to subtly shift the conversation uh, when it's possible is not to shift blame, because again, that uh, can have negative uh, consequences, but if there are uh, other players, um, for instance, if a politician is suddenly taking a grand stand on your issue and trying to make an example out of you in a way that's uh, really disingenuous, you might be able to uh, throw some light on that in order to uh, just to, uh, again, subtly shift the conversation so it's not all the blame is on yourself. Um, and then uh, the last tip here is don't censor comments. So as uh, your, if your Facebook feed is suddenly filling with a bunch of negative comments, it can be very tempting to uh, want to delete some of them. Um, but if you recall what happened a few years ago with uh, Nestle, uh, they had a huge social media thing around uh, the fact that they used palm oil in their products. And so all over Facebook, people started posting things. And uh, what Nestle did was they went and they just started deleting the comments. And then once people found out that the public discourse was being censored and they were, their comments were being deleted, then it became an entirely new social media crisis of its own, where Nestle doesn't care what people have to say. And um, so you just you, you want to avoid uh, that, that pitfall. So uh, let's move into uh, how you actually use uh, social monitoring to spot the crisis as it happens. Uh, what we have here is uh, we've used uh, NetVibes to set up a dashboard to monitor all the news, uh, blogs, social media, articles, everything online about the NFL. Um, this just gives you uh, an overview of uh, what the dashboard looks like. There are multiple tabs. There are a lot of different charts in here and different ways of looking at the information. But I'm going to uh, walk you through a, a few of the charts that have some interesting insights. So uh, what we have right here is if you look at the positive uh, versus negative coverage about the NFL, um, so this, this dashboard begins on September 13th. Well, the crisis uh, was just beginning, um, so we can't see what it actually looked like before. Um, but what you'll notice is there's a huge spike on uh, September 18th, where not only the, the negative coverage went up a lot, but also the positive coverage, which is interesting. But really, the, the conversation spiked around that point. And so um, if we want to look um, at how the, the conversation differed before and after September 18th, uh, we can uh, get some interesting insights into what was actually happening, happening online in the social conversation. So uh, what we have right here are some charts comparing um, who uh, were the top uh, Twitter authors who were talking about the NFL or the National Football League um, for the four days before September 18th and the four days after. And so what you'll notice in this chart on the left uh, is uh, first the numbers are a lot lower, um, but they're completely different people uh, compared to uh, after things really blew up on September 18th. It became a whole new uh, set of people who were tweeting uh, in the hundreds of times uh, about the topic, which is interesting. Um, so this is just a good way for you to hone in who the influencers are, who's really driving the conversation online. Uh, in this chart, again, you can see uh, what happened on September 18th. Uh, this is interesting in that it shows uh, several of the names that have been uh, involved in this crisis, some of the players as well as uh, Roger Goodell, the commissioner. Uh, one thing that's interesting here is that uh, prior to September 18th, Roger Goodell really wasn't mentioned at all. And then um, he became a lot more of the conversation in this blue color here uh, as time went on. Uh, Ray Rice, of course, he spiked on this time and remained a large part of the conversation. But it's interesting to see how that uh, switched over time. Now, this is another way of uh, looking at that same graph. So uh, what, what we have here, again, uh, the different colors are uh, these different players as well as the commissioner and how often they were mentioned in uh, different channels. 
So if you look uh, in the, the press and the media, it's interesting that uh, uh, so before uh, September 18th, Roger Goodell in this blue color was mentioned somewhat, but not nearly as much as the other players, versus after uh, September 18th, Roger Goodell was the number one name mentioned in all the, the press and media. But if you actually look at uh, the social networks, which is this uh, next section down, he was hardly mentioned at all on social media before September 18th. And even afterward, he was mentioned more, but it seems that people online were still much more interested in actually discussing the players who are involved rather than, than the commissioner. Um, so uh, what this chart shows uh, is a tag cloud. Um, for all the, this shows the, the keywords and the frequency with which they were associated with NFL online through all of these different sources. And so, again, if you look uh, before September 18th, uh, Ray Rice is a big name. Um, but then afterward, uh, the, the names uh, shift slightly. Um, so it just it shows uh, how the conversation evolved. Um, those four days before September 18th, a lot of the conversation was about the, uh, the different uh, sponsors pulling out uh, their money and support of the NFL. So that's why Anheuser-Busch is on here. Um, and then uh, afterward, it shows how the conversation shifted and uh, different keywords were being associated. So this is just another way of looking, um, just to make sure that you have all the information available about what's actually being said and so that you can respond um, directly to what people are saying. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Marty, who will show us how uh, the Persona social media management tool uh, can be useful in all of this. Okay, great. All right. So we created uh, a couple of social media channels, uh, accounts specific to this. One, Fans for Better, Better NFL on Twitter, uh, the NFL 12th Man on, on Facebook, and we started publishing content. And just a couple of quick caveats here. Uh, we did not have access to the league social media accounts. Uh, obviously, if this was the NFL doing it, they would be able to publish to their followers, they would be able to publish to the followers of the teams, and uh, they would have been able to uh, reach a lot more people than we did. So this is really just a demonstration of what to do. Uh, so first thing we did is uh, we, we started publishing quite a lot of, of uh, content, uh, you know, 11 pieces this day, 7, 11, 10, and we're getting a decent number of responses considering the situation. But we found uh, as we started to tweak the content uh, to look at what people were responding to and then giving them more of that, that things started to uh, to even out. So if you look at the amount of content that we were publishing and the responses to it, we were starting to see uh, a better ratio of publishing uh, and responses. Um, we also started to see when people were actually responding to what we did. You, know, you hear a lot on social media about when you should publish in general. Uh, a lot of that misses the point. It's not when people are on social media, it's when people will respond to you on social media. So there was a spike uh, first thing in the morning, probably uh, as people were just getting to work uh, and before they got serious about work, and uh, then in the afternoon and into the early evening. Uh, the other thing that we started to look at is, were we maintaining our momentum? Were we publishing enough content uh, to really start to attract uh, a good uh, audience response out there. And any time we were trending up, it meant that we were publishing a lot, and also it meant that we were getting a better response. Uh, we then started to look at what people were responding to. And one of the things here, the, fir the, the first things we noticed is that content that we published, uh, and I'll go to it right here, uh, this was uh, an article taking uh, a, a female perspective on this. This was women weighing in on the scandal. Uh, and we found that this really started to uh, to get a better response. So what we published here is uh, on uh, Twitter, you know, you, you think gender doesn't matter in coverage of the NFL domestic violence? Think again. Uh, and it was this piece of content. So really starting to get a better understanding of what uh, people responded to, what we could publish out there that would help change the conversation, and again, uh, really a combination of, uh, of content that would start to highlight some of the strengths of the league, things that the league was doing right, and also 
publishing uh, critical but fair content and coming and saying, yeah, we screwed up here, uh, and we're going to do things to, to be uh, better about it. Uh, and that's really how you start to, um, you know, dampen a little bit of the, the damage um, by uh, getting people to look at things in, from a different perspective, in a different light, uh, and to consider facts and facets of, of the situation that they may have lost track of. Okay. With that, Kim, I'll turn it back over to you, um, and uh, we can uh, take some questions. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, the first question that we have is, uh, this is directed to NetVibes. How does your tool determine what is negative uh, versus positive social media conversations? So are nuances in language taken into account, such as sarcasm and words that are typically considered negative but have a positive connotation? Uh, this is interesting, of course. Um, a lot of different tools have uh, the sentiment analysis, and the technology is not perfect yet. So I'll go ahead and tell you that. but uh, what it does is uh, NetVibes is powered by this tool, Exalead, and so they do the sentiment analysis. And again, it's, uh, it's mainly based on uh, keywords. It's mostly quite accurate, although, uh, as I said, it's not completely perfect yet. Uh, one thing that's uh, interesting to note, uh, let's see, I didn't actually use the slide uh, in uh, the conversation, but so generally what you'll see with these types of slides with the positive and negative is overwhelmingly there will be a small amount of negative, a little bit of positive, but mostly it will be all of this neutral, uh, which is in the gray. But if you actually look at the NFL conversation, um, of, on September 18th, it reached the positive and negative together reached about 50%, which is much higher than you would normally see. So this just goes to show uh, that the level of emotions were really running high in this conversation. Normally, you, in any type of graph like this, you would see a lot more of the gray. Uh, let's see. Then uh, the next question that we have, um, I believe this one's going to be directed more toward uh, Marty. Um, so they want to know, uh, what's the balance between too much communication and not enough? Um, since we talked about the importance of uh, getting information out there and helping to shape the conversation. Is sure. there a, a perfect balance that can be hit? Sure. Uh, thanks, Kim, and, and thanks for whoever asked the question. Um, so two, two aspects to this. One is it's always more important to focus on quality over quantity. Uh, it's really getting the right content out there. Uh, and, and certainly if you're uh, the organization dealing with the crisis, you have the ability to generate content on your own in addition to third-party content. Uh, it's really a mix of both. Uh, you want to be seen as being proactive in terms of what you're putting out there, uh, announcements, press releases, statements, and also finding third-party content because that's always more credible in a situation like this and, uh, and finding third-party content that supports your, your cause uh, really covers some of the things that I talked about before. As far as qu uh, the quantity, uh, it, it's about consistency. Uh, if you keep putting content out there on, on a regular basis, uh, there's a, a very wise public relations uh, executive that uh, I knew uh, back in the day who had a concept called rolling thunder. Uh, and that is always, you know, instead of having one big announcement, break it up into two, three, four smaller announcements that you can roll out one after the other after the other. And the same thing applies to, to social media. It's really uh, about making sure that you're out there consistently, publishing certainly several times a day on Twitter, at least once if not twice a day on, on Facebook, and making sure that there's a reason for people to keep checking back with you. I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, another question we just got. Uh, you noted not to censor comments. However, when is it okay to intervene? For example, customers posting extremely negative, name calling, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, again, th there's a fine line here. Of course, um, anytime someone is being abusive, um, using foul language, or something that's just really not appropriate, that's the sort of thing that's fine to censor. Um, where you get into trouble is if uh, you just write down comments simply because you don't like what they have to say. And so again, that's uh, it's definitely a judgment call on the part of whoever's uh, running things. But uh, th there's definitely a, a balance to be struck there. 
Um, let's see. And then uh, one last question uh, we got is, how do you spot a crisis early? So um, that was a little difficult to see on the dashboard that we put. Um, like I said, we obviously had no idea that the NFL crisis was going to happen, but as soon as it did, that was when we put the dashboard together. So things you can see how the conversation went after about September 13th. But assuming that this is your organization, what you can do is obviously you'll have a dashboard set up and so you're monitoring the conversation as it goes, but how do you actually spot that crisis as it happens? Um, and so we, NetVibes offers a lot of the tools to help you do that. Uh, you can set up real-time alerts. You'll actually get an email um, if things in your dashboard uh, hit certain metrics or anything that it really specifies. So if you want to make it so um, a sentiment analysis, if all of a sudden 25% of the conversation about you is negative, you can get an, an instant email alert about that. Or uh, uh, the other thing you can do is uh, to have a keyword cloud can be can be helpful. So that way you can see, um, as we showed in this webinar, uh, what keywords are actually being associated with your brand, um, and then if something suddenly comes up in the word cloud that people are talking about, that gives you another way of actually seeing what, what they're saying. I think that's it. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today, and thank you, Marty, for all of your questions. If anyone has any follow-up questions or would like to learn more about either NetVibes or Persona, our email addresses are here on the slide, and we would love to hear from you. So again, thank you for joining.